Hello everyone and welcome to this session on closed loop cooling systems. We've got uh, Avian here from Wrecking Host a Distillery. Hello, nice to see you. Hi everyone, hi David. Um, so, water cooling, um, how um, is it typically done? And you know, let's talk a bit about your journey because I know you've basically found your own solution. So that's quite exciting. Yes, I mean, you know, obviously one of the key elements of distilling is the condensing phase. Uh, and to do that, traditionally, you use cold water. Now, um, old Alembic stills would tend to use a worm screw uh, in a large container of water. Um, with bigger, bigger volume stills, um, you tend to have less space to be able to do that. And in fact, the stills we use, um, they, they incorporate what's known as a shotgun condenser. So at the top of the, the column, uh, you have a, a section of tubing where traditionally you pass uh, cold water through. Um, the vapors would then condense at the top um, and then come off the sill to, to be collected as product. Um, the stills we use are uh, the Dutch eye stills. Um, and I think from design, um, they were created to basically work off mains pressure uh, tap water. And so this basically the whole um, of the condensing process is just by having something cold next to the hot spirit vapor. I mean, that's the long and short of it, right? The very basics of it. Absolutely. Um, it's one of those those weird situations that we had quite a lot of difficulty trying to get our heads around it. And we'd spoken to plumbers and to uh, refrigeration engineers, just trying to understand what's the mathematics of, of how do you work out how much water you need to, to get it done. <coughs> and unfortunately, it's one of those things that neither of those um, two skill sets were quite the right ones for it. Plumbers are very, very good at, at how do you get water, make it hot and make it run baths and radiators and showers and whatnot. And refrigeration engineers are very good at how much energy is required to make an environment or a, a, a piece of equipment cold. When it's that sort of movable feast, and obviously as you're distilling, uh, the temperature will climb as you go through the run. It's how do you remove that energy on an ongoing basis um, and keep that system within ultimately safe levels? Um, but more practically uh, in production levels. So, you know, you've got the control over that vapor. You don't want that vapor leaking out anywhere. It's dangerous, but it's also your finished product. Um, and you want that vapor to condense down into a cool, usable liquid that you can run off and store and, and, and collect uh, as, you, as your run's going on. So that was the hard bit, was trying to understand how do we approach this um, and I think the, the, the sort of from factory design was flood it with cold water. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I guess in the UK, we're fortunate enough. It was one, hey, one of the pluses probably with our climate, maybe. Um, but generally, our mains water is cold enough, even generally in the summer, to be cold enough so that you can use it for the, to run the condensers. Yes. Um, other places that's not i know that it's not necessarily the case and depending on where your water um is coming from i think also like sometimes it's easy to think oh the condenser it's just how we get the vapor back into a form which is drinkable <laughs> almost um but actually that that speed at which you run your condenser and i know I speak to a number of the sillers and they, they talk about this, the speed that the condensers run, that makes a huge difference on the flavor as well, because it's about the speed of how the still is running as well. So it's not just about energy going into the still, it's also about how quickly that cooling is working. And I guess, you know, when the cooling stops working, what what you what you get is just the vapor just comes straight out. And then, then you've got just vapor that's escaping into your distillery, which is not... Not the safest not, thing in the world. Suboptimal, David. <laughs> Suboptimal. Yes. Exactly. <clears throat> yes. Um, I think it, you know that, that very real risk um, of of ethanol vapor being introduced into your working environment um, it, it is a constant concern and something that we all have to really be very aware and very careful of. Um, but you're right. I think <clears throat> if if you've got um, uh, inefficient condensing, you are going to be losing flavor. You're going to be losing control over the, the product run. 
Um, and obviously, there are going to be elements from your finished drink that, that just leak away and, and disappear. So, you know, for me, very much on the safety uh, front, but also on, on the product control and, and quality control, it's essential to try and understand uh, that condensing part of the equation uh, and to have that control and that, that uh, consistency with it. So using a sort of <laughs> off-the-shelf condenser, let's say one of these ones where, you know, you're getting the water's coming in cold from the mains and it's going out warmer because it's been used to condense this mm -hmm. sort of standard kind of system, whether that's a shotgun type condenser or the worm type or whatever it would be. I guess the you know, look at thinking about pros and cons. I guess one of the pros is availability and choice because it's kind of the standard thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, are there other pros and uh, and certainly what are the cons of that? Because obviously there was something that led you, and we'll move on to that, led you on to wanting to do something different. Yes. I think, um, the, as you said, the pros are very much, um, you turn the tap on and it's always there. Um, you can design a system around it because broadly speaking, you know, whilst water pressure will fluctuate from uh, area to area, it, within an area, once you've established what that water pressure is, it's fairly consistent. Um, from a cost point of view, just for setup, um, it, it's all the kit is already there. It, it's just bog standard plumbing. So you're not looking at wildly exotic or elaborate pieces of equipment to deliver the cold water to your system. So, you know, at, at, at relatively small scale, uh, it's, a, it's a super way of doing things. You know, the cost is quite low. The barrier to entry is quite low. And the skill set required for somebody to effectively run a hose from the mains to your condenser, you, you, you're not looking at anything exotic. So mm. on the pro side, there's a lot going for it. I think very quickly, uh, as you move from, dare we say, you know, very small installations, the cons start coming in, as we found, we'll get on to later, they come in quite heavily. Yeah. Uh, and I think the main one, the thing that really spurred us slightly twofold one is when you go up a little bit in pipe size it's astonishing how much exponentially more water you end up using <coughs> um and that obviously then brings the the moral issue of how much good quality treated potable tap water uh, are you wasting now as, as you said Debbie, we're, we're very fortunate in this country we don't really have water shortages as such um, but I think more and more it's still a natural resource that we can't really be seen to just be whizzing up the wall. Mm. Uh, and I think it's worth, just for absolute clarity, all this water, which is, <laughs> like you said, totally potable, totally drinking, lovely, um, you know, depending on where you are. I mean, I guess like, so like here in Portsmouth, we've got much harder water than some places down in the, you know, yes. in the West Coast. We, so we, very... We're lucky we've got very soft water down here. Yeah. Um, but you have, you know, like, just straight from the tap and, 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 and happy days. Yes. Um, this water that you're using for the condensing, this is not, doesn't, it goes nowhere near the actual spirit oh. is that you end up drinking. It's always separated by copper tubing or something like that. It's always the yes. other side of it. So this is not, not going into the product that's being made. So then once it's done, it's just, it's just waste. Pushed away as it were. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, you know, in, in, in whichever method of, of condensing uh, people will use, it is basically that interface between the hot vapor and a cold liquid. Um, as you said, within a copper pipe or a stainless steel tube or a, a basin or what have you. And it's just shifting that state from, from gas back to liquid. Uh, the heat energy from the gas, your ethanol vapor is transferred over into your cooling water. And like you said, that water's then then waste and, and away. And it goes. that energy's yeah. wasted as well, I guess, as well. I mean, that's the other thing. I, don't, yeah. I mean, I know different people have some energy recovery systems, but of course, that's the other thing is that's energy transferred to the water and then again down into the sewers, as it were. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and obviously, you know, in, in the UK, um, we pay for the water to come into the building and then we pay about double in sewerage for it to go out again. So... You, you're just chucking money literally down the drain. Yep. 
I see we did that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into it a little bit more into the numbers. What we're talking about really is the bottom line, because that's really the key thing. Distilling is a business. You know, mm -hmm. it's an art as well, but it is fundamentally a business. If you're not making yes. enough money, then you can't keep doing it. So let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, you know, th there are many pressures as distillers. Uh, and I think everybody involved in the industry at the moment is seeing prices going up on across the board, um, whether it's bottles or boxes or transport or raw materials. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, David. Yes, distilling is is a passion. It's something that that you know we strive for excellence in. But you're right; it's a business. And um, with every business, cash is king. And if you've got areas of the business that are just needlessly wasting money, uh, that's not sustainable um, purely from a business point of view. So, I mean, <laughs> I'd like to pretend that we were wildly far sighted uh, and, and and very uh, cognizant of all the issues. Um, which is what led us to, to what we're talking about today. We weren't, we got a thumping great water bill. So with, with, with the stills we, we're using, uh, we moved to new premises and bought a larger still. Um, the original still we'd actually run on a very crude, um, sort of, if you like, first generation closed loop system. Um, and when we moved to the new premises, we simply ran out of time and ran out of available cash to, to reinstigate um, those systems and upgrade them for the new still we've got. Um, so pretty much the expediency was we have to get the stills on, we have to get producing, we've got orders to fulfill, you know, this new piece of kit's got to earn its keep. Um, and we pretty much just plugged them into the mains water supply. Uh, and they ran perfectly fine. Um, within the first six months, we had our local water board, Southwest Water, uh, got in touch, uh, desperately trying to find out how big our leak was. Um, I think our water usage had gone from the odd flushing of a toilet um, to 670 cubic meters. Uh, and that came along with its, with its bill of 8,000 pounds. So, <clears throat> that was a real wake-up call and, and, and it, it made me go back and start looking at the numbers again because we were like Christ please please say we've got a leak uh, please say it isn't the stills um, and it's when you start looking at those cold hard numbers you realize just how water hungry our industry is um, I mean for example most people at home will have the standard 15 millimeter copper piping or plastic piping uh, and we reckon that's roughly doing about 10 to maybe 15 litres a minute in flow rate. Uh, the new still, we stepped up to a 25 millimetre pipe, which you put them side by side and they're a little bit different, but you don't give it much thought. Um, when we did the, the bucket test for that, we discovered it's throwing out 45 litres a minute. So that was a big step up. We just didn't really appreciate and, and get our heads around. Um, when you combine that with our, our big still, our 2000 litre still, we'll have anywhere between a 10 and a 14 hour uh, run time that's requiring condensing. Very quickly, at 45 litres a minute for 14 hours, we were wasting swimming pools of water every <laughs> single time we switched it on. Um, and I think, you know, when you, you combine those two, you know, we looked at it and said, well, okay, I always had the number in my head that the, the, the smaller the 500 litres still on the domestic piping. Yeah, okay, in, in extremis, we were wasting about six, six odd thousand litres of water in cooling for a complete run. <coughs> Setting aside whether or not it's morally reprehensible to waste that much water, from a cost point of view, at 6,300 litres, I think that would probably come in and cost us 30, 40 quid. Well, well, as part of a run producing three or 400 bottles of, of finished, finished product, it was not nice, but, but it was tolerable. You could live with that. When we did the same numbers and ran it up to the 2,000 litres still, we discovered that was wasting 40,000 litres per run. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got a fourfold increase in product and, you know, a massive hike in, you know, almost five, sixfold hike in the amount of water wasted. Straight away, we realized that, well, that's, that's just not, 
not sensible. You know, we're wasting what five, ten thousand pounds a year. Yeah. And I think we're, with everybody's very, very tight on their margins right now, you can probably all work out in your head how many extra bottle sales you'd have to make to uh, just pay for water going down the drain. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, I mean, I guess it's one of these things, isn't it? It's um, as with any aspect of the business, it's only when you come and sit down and measure it, yeah, that you realize because much so. so much you just be, oh, we'll hook it in and it's done. And and, 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 like, and that yeah. also that that scaling, I mean, that was something that I hadn't really appreciated that you move, you know, four times the size of the still or something like that, but mm. the water for the condenser is not. It's not that linear no. thing. So, you know, so potentially, if you'd not thought about it beforehand, even your figures that you've got for your business case to, to have that larger still yes. would be off. Yeah. Yeah, quite quite significantly as well. Yes. Um, and I think you know, it is one of those things that with the, the smaller stills, you, you can lull yourself into a full sense of security and think, oh, well, you know, it's only some tens of pounds every time we run it that's kind of the cost of operating you know it's 30 quid doesn't really matter we'll, we'll just carry on as we are uh, when it gets up to the bigger unit and it's two three hundred pounds every time you run it even then that there is you know you can look at it and say well what's the the, the downside here we've got to change things around we've got to get tradesmen in we've got to do a lot of work and effort on this and that's all well and good. But then if you're running that still 20, 30, 40 times in a year, that little bit of oversight very quickly leaves a, a, a quite considerable hole in the cash flow. Yeah. And it's not going away. No. Every year. Every year. Absolutely. And the price is not going to go down either. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a price go down, actually, apart from finished products. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your issue. Um, what do you do about it? I mean, you said you said that you'd previously you'd worked on you'd had something on the smaller scale yeah. in the previous location, so you've got this problem. How do you go about tackling it? I think it, it, looking at the the forums and obviously talking with other distillers, condensing has you know it, it's an issue that I think everybody faces. How best do we do that? Um, Quite simply, a lot of people will use a refrigeration unit. Um, we're far too mean and, you know, short arms, long pockets. Um, we weren't prepared to spend the tens of thousands of pounds uh, to have one of those um, installed. Uh, we needed to find, you know, a usable, workable, low cost option. <coughs> and refrigeration has a cost, again, there's a, a, cost. There's a cost for running that as well, huh? Very much so. I think, you know, the, the thing with refrigeration, it's, it's exceptionally, um, it works exceptionally well, but you've got the capital cost of the piece of equipment. Um, it's a big unit, so it has to go somewhere. And I think that's what we all forget is, you know, as you start to grow the business, space is always at a premium, it has to go somewhere. It's using a lot of energy. Um, it uses refrigerant um, chemicals, which, you know, have a dubious uh, environmental situation. Uh, it needs maintaining and servicing and it needs the chemicals replacing every year. And, you know, there's an on cost to it. And if nothing else, it's tied up, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 pounds of your business's money in what is a fairly rudimentary part of, uh, of of the process you know just for the condensing hmm. <coughs> yeah no one gets excited and goes oh we're gonna go to the distillery and, and see the refrigeration <laughs> unit oh! so, <laughs> my goodness that's a fine three ton refrigerator you've got there <laughs> and i guess the other problem is with that if it breaks down what the hell do you do you know that uh, i think they're pretty reliable pieces of equipment, but they're so it's it becomes so fundamental to your production that if anything happens with it, everything else has to stop. Yeah. So we we looked at it and we we had some some great help from some very generous people. Uh, I think I drove a few um, refrigeration engineers slightly dotty 
uh, trying to get my head round delta T's and um, tempera temperature differentials and never really quite managed it. Um, but it was just trying to find out, well, how much water needs to be in contact with the condensing part for what length of time and at what temperature gradient to allow the equipment to run efficiently. Um, so what we looked at doing, like I said, we, we had a rudimentary um, system running for our old stills. <coughs> Worked perfectly with the little 50 meter still. And it was basically an IBC of, of tap water, uh, a bit of hose pipe, central heating pump, and it would just cycle it through. It just about kept up with the bigger 500 litre still, um, but we had to then run that in two stages. So we do the product run one day, let the IBC of water cool down a bit, and then we do our tails collection run the following day. So not ideal, but that was the work in progress that when we moved to the bigger mm -hmm. forces, we were going to do. When we got the water bill through, that moved up the, the agenda quite quickly. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> So effectively, we, we looked at it and said, right, what we need to do is, is look at the design of the still and very quickly realise that obviously all of the physics in the building of the still, the en energy elements, the condenser size, the column width, that was all predicated around effectively mains water pressure. So all we needed to do was pretty much replicate that flow rate of, of, of water to allow the physical um, chiller shotgun uh, condenser in the still to do its job. But then we also needed to work out, well, how much energy is going into the, the system and over what period of time, how much water will we require to effectively absorb that much energy over the, 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 the length of the distilling run and give us a bit of leeway either side because you know as we said right at the outset as soon as you run out of cooling water um we, we find with the sills they, they will run you get a heat run and it'll run away from you very quickly yeah. luckily ours have a fail safe that will shut off the the power but if you don't have that kind of fail safe if you're steam driven or direct fired the risk is all of a sudden you, you've got this ethanol vapor cannon that's firing um uh, ethanol vapor into the environment you're working in uh, and is potentially very very dangerous so we needed to have way more than we thought we'd need to make sure that there's there's a bit of safety net either side yeah i mean if you're direct fired lethal lethal consequences yeah. with yes. you know those two things being in the same room so so yeah so, so that, that, that's that was kind of the mission uh was to try and start doing some very difficult sums, well, difficult for me anyway, was um, to, to try and work out, well, how, how do we get this put, all, put, all put together? Um, and then I had my mate and business partner, Craig, at the other end of the phone saying, basically do it, but you're not allowed to spend any money. So it was, how can we, how can we achieve this <laughs> for, uh, for as little as possible? <clears throat> so in, in true Heath Robinson style, um, off we went. Um, yeah, so um, we, we needed to look at a system that would, like, like we said, replicate mains water pressure, uh, have enough of a reservoir of, 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 of cold water to see the run through, uh, but not be so big that, you know, we're, we're just being ridiculous. Um, <coughs> I know talking with the guys at Greensand, very jealous that they've got a whole lake they can draw water from. Uh, unfortunately, we, we weren't in that fortunate position. Um, I mean, not, not, not to totally denigrate chillers, I think, you know, a refrigeration unit certainly has its place. If you're very restricted on space, it can be an ideal solution for what you're looking to, to achieve. Uh, we were quite fortunate that uh, on the glamorous industrial estate uh, we're on, uh, the landlords are, uh, are very good at allowing us use of uh, floor space outside of the building. Um, so our solution was basically provide a, a huge reservoir of, of cold water uh, and to basically pump it around a closed loop system into the stills uh, to, to give us our cooling. <coughs> like we said earlier, the, the, the big 2,000 litre still, if it's running for 14 hours plus a half hour cool down, 
running at about 45 litres a minute. We're looking at uh, total water throughput of somewhere in the region of 40,000 litres. <coughs> now, working out how much energy goes into the water and the increase in temperature of that reservoir of water over time, the, the starting point would be, well, you're going to need 40,000 litres of water. Well, actually, once we did the sums on it, we realised that we could probably get away with half the water going through the system twice because it's picking up some energy um, but obviously as it's going back into the tank full of cold water you get it doesn't all rise by 20 30 degrees it'll rise in total by roughly half that mm. which means that by the second and even third cycle it's still cool enough to provide you with the delta you require to go from vapor to liquid safely so we ended up with uh, an enormous, we, we call it the submarine. We've got this enormous 25,000 litre uh, water tank out the back of the building. Um, we had to have a concrete pad poured for it. And it's terrifying. When, when you fill it up, they, they actually sag out at the bottom, which was very alarming with 25 tonnes of water sat in it. But it seems to be fine. So, uh, uh, And from there, we, we just had our, our local plumbers in and they just fitted um the the two loop systems <coughs> we fitted two pumps so we could run both stills independently um and it also means that within that system we've got the ability which we'll perhaps cover off in in, in a minute uh to re-divert some of that energy from the condensing um back into other other purposes within the distillery which for me i think that's quite exciting going forwards that you know, most, well, pretty much all the energy we put into boiling our, our washes just gets wasted. It goes, there's no point of recovery for it. So that's something I think is going to be quite good fun. Um, the second bit was the, the, the plumbers were very keen. Obviously, the, the tanks outside, we had to look at what was the risk of freezing. Um, down here in the West Country, we're quite lucky. We don't get that many days below zero. But certainly in other parts of the country, that's something that really would have to be uh, taken into consideration for anyone looking at this kind of system. Um, they, they were looking very much at uh, putting a lot of uh, antifreeze into the into the water. The cost of that at that scale was thousands of pounds. Um, so we've opted to take a little bit of a, a view on that. Um, and when we see the weather reports of, of uh, low temperatures, we run the pumps overnight just to keep everything moving. Uh, okay. But I think if if you are in, you know, outside of uh, the mild West Country, that's something you really, really need to to give some consideration to. Uh, insulation, antifreeze, what have you. Um, there's very, very microscopic risk of, of that water with uh, antifreeze in it contacting your product. You know, whichever kind of still you have, there is that physical copper, steel, whatever barrier between the cooling water and the vapour. Uh, but again, it, it's something to be be aware of if that chemical is in your um, your system, you, you have to make allowances for it because I, I don't, don't think anyone wants antifreeze in their, in their spirit. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Even uh, if it's colour changing. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and the final thing we looked at was obviously, you know, any uh, reserve of water is going to end up with some biological activity. So, you know, there are commercial um, anti-sludge chemicals and anti-microbial um, chemicals. I, I wasn't keen on having those in the distillery. Uh, same with the antifreeze, partly because they were going to cost an absolute fortune. Secondly, they'd have to be replaced pretty much every year. Um, and thirdly, you know, they are hazardous, they are toxic. If we can avoid doing that, so much the better. So my solution to uh, the biocide thing uh, was basically to add on a, a very simple additional loop to the pump system uh, that pumps the water through a UV uh, sterilizing kit. So constantly that little pump's just ticking away yeah. and it'll slowly process through the whole tank of water and just make sure that we don't have, you know, bacterial or algal blooms and all sorts of unpleasantness growing in it. Yeah, well, that seems to make sense. The physical positioning relative to the distillery, 
were you cognizant like that you wanted it on a north facing wall or was it just where it had to be or was that any sort of consideration? It was luckily, I mean, it, it's actually on the southwest corner of the building because unfortunately that's where it had to be. But yes, absolutely. If you've got the freedom to put it wherever you want it, if you pardon the, the expression, um, definitely try and find that out of direct sunlight, you know, any anywhere where it's ambiently going to be the coldest spot to, to just keep that water chilled. You know, at the end of the day, it is a vast black plastic tank. And in the middle of the summer, it will absorb an awful lot of heat and heat it up. Um, fortunately, the tolerances on the water that are coming in, we from calculation reckon even at 30 to 35 degrees centigrade coming in at the right flow rate, it should still uh, condense uh, the vapor. Uh, but optimally, it needs to be below 10. So if you can position it somewhere to do that, yeah, absolutely. Mm, right. And um, I guess the other question is is it possible to talk a little bit about the sort of the cost? Of such, yeah. of such a system because I think that's you know people are thinking about it they're like okay it's not as expensive as a refrigeration unit but you know what is the cost and and I guess also based on that you can start to have a bit of a think about yeah. payback times as well I guess yes yes and it's um uh something we, um that, that you know obviously you need to look at um so I, I think in in broad terms the cost running against you is always going to be what the water authority are charging you for water in uh, and for sewerage. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we were looking at, um, you know, just an, an annual uh, water usage. Um, and this is based on the two stills, the, the 500 litre and the 2000 litre. Uh, and just working on what our run schedule for products this year is going to be. Uh, we're looking at 24 to 25 runs on, on the smaller unit and 50 runs on the bigger unit. So combining those two, like we said earlier, uh, the smaller still will use about 6,300 litres per run and the bigger still will be using 39, 40,000 litres. Uh, so just on those runs alone, which is, you know, running the 500 once a fortnight uh, and running the big still just shy of once a week. So it's not really intensive usage, uh, that was coming out just shy of um, 2,000 cubic metres of water, so 2 million litres. If you apply your, your metered water rates to that, <coughs> you know, we're looking there at just shy of 2,000 units, 2,000 cubic metres. Uh, our current rates are about £5.40, combining sewage and supply Per, per unit per cubic meter. So straight away, our year one bill for running the stills just for the water alone was gonna be 10 and a half thousand pounds. So that's where you can start looking at, well, do we go 25, 30 grand for a chili unit? Our repayment period on that just for the water wastage, just plugging into the tap, you're looking at maybe three to five years. Um, we looked at it and said, well, actually our system, it's a little bit Heath Robinson to start with, but it was a couple of grand for the plumbers. It was a, I think the tank was about 3,000 uh, pounds and about 500 quid for the, for the pumps. Uh, so all in, I think the system cost us about six, about 6,000 pounds just shy of. So our payback is pretty much first six months. Yeah. And going forward, we're saving or not spending ten grand a year uh, to just on water. Hmm. And what I mean, what are the sort of are there any cons that you found on having this system? Because on the face of it, everything that you said, it kind of seems like a no brainer. Mm -hmm. But I guess like everything, there's always that that other side to it. And I'm intrigued as to you know, yeah, what I that, think what that what that might be. Definitely, I, I think you know, the, the con is you've got limited control. So it's pretty much a, a, a one trick pony. You know, once it's installed, that's all it can do. You can't, 
you know, if you if you want more control over it, well, you can add a, a, a refrigeration unit to keep the water. But straight away, it's like, well, you've negated the point of having a, a low cost, low barrier to entry system. <clears throat> it takes up a hell of a lot of space. Um, you know, the, the, the tank itself has probably got a footprint of about three square meters. Um, you have got all the additional piping coming into the building. Um, you are a bit snookered if the pumps fail. I mean, admittedly, they're quite cheap and easy to replace and what have you, but there is an issue with that. Um, I think the, the biggest issue for growing distilleries is do you put in a system that will cope with your future plans or do you put something in that will do what you want it to do now and continually be adding to it? Because although it, it's scalable by getting bigger tanks, it, it's not a straightforward thing. You can't sort of dial it up to setting seven and, and it'll do what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. If you decided, you know, things are going well, the demand's there, you want to put in another 2,000 litre sill or something like that. Yeah. And yep. have you got the space to put it there in the same place? Do you do another tank in yep. tandem? Or do you do a whole new bigger tank or... What, what what's the what's absolutely, the situation absolutely so so I, I think those, those are probably the only cons that you know it, it is a physical solution and it takes up space and you may not have um the ability to use that space i think the other thing you have to be aware of is um the, the season the environment you're in you, know, you almost have to look at it and say well right middle of summer do we really want to be running the still on a hot sunny day when we know that the cooling water isn't at the low temperature we'd like it to be at so you, you kind of have to be a little more reactive um yep. to, to the, the the ambient environment <clears throat> and also that if if you're in a situation where christ we've got to get this product out i need to run it today you know i need to do five runs this week physically the cooling water might not have had time overnight to cool down to usable so the there are some some drawbacks to it as a solution. Hmm. I think for a business like ours who who can look at it and say, well, look, generally we'll run the still once or twice a week. There's a bit of time to do that. It, it works for us. And I think you can take the methodology and just scale it up if you've got the space to do it, to, to accept quicker run times, quicker turnaround times, hmm. or still, so it's doable. If you, and it's not the point, because of course, I mean, we talk, we're talk we talking about the cost, and of course, there's a huge environmental benefit, which we've not even yeah. factored in to the cost of anything, and to an extent, the future-proofing of yourself against potentially higher water bills. Yeah. Um, but uh, is the system compatible with such that, let's say, that you really needed to do a run, for whatever reason, to meet whatever contractual obligations, mm -hmm. Could you just hook it up to yeah. the mains anyway? Or would you just drain the tank and refill it and do it that way? Because that would be less. If you're talking about 40,000 litres versus 25,000 litres, it strikes me it makes more sense. Although, because it takes time to do that, maybe it makes more sense to do that. But anyway. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, our fail safe has always been if we have to get a run out and the system for whatever reason isn't working, yes, we can we can just very simply change of hose resort to, to tap water. Yeah. Uh, I mean, touch wood so far that hasn't happened, but I'm, I'm always keen in the distillery to pretty much have redundancy in, in, yeah. in all systems. So if the worst does happen, you can carry on. Um, you know, we've had it um, occasionally where, you know, you've got to get a run out, switch it over to tap water and, and just, accept that you're wasting all this water and all this money but the expedient is that if you have to get that run out it has to go out the door that's it and and does the water need changing in the system uh the, so you've got this twenty five thousand. it's twenty five thousand liters isn't it this yeah. tank does that i mean you've got the uv filtration aspect on it mm -hmm. but does that water ever need changing or because i mean it's never again it's like we're saying before this water's not going in the product it's just there so yes. is that it shouldn't do i think um you know we, we did 
try and uh, have a look at well is there risk of legionnaires um what's the 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 the, the uh, biological potential with having that water just sat there um our view at the moment is the honest answer is I don't know yet um but like you said it's not coming into contact with anything it's not part of 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 um the 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 the, the product uh, the production side of things you know it's not going anywhere near the the, the the finished liquids it is in a sealed contained unit in some ways it's being heated up and cooled down on a regular basis so you know although we're not reaching pasteurization temperatures it's never going to be a comfortable environment for for microbes to grow um but it is it is something that we will need to just keep an eye on mm. um and that's really why right from the outset the plumbers were saying look you're going to need something because i think you know, we all look at our central heating systems um, over a period of years, they will build up sludge and, you know, detritus, and that can lead to, you know, blockages and burst pipes and inefficient heating systems. So, yeah, I, I, it, at some point, it possibly will need to be replaced. Um, but we don't know timescales at the moment. Uh, it's been in place now for 18 months. Mm. And we haven't had an issue. So, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, it's been really, really interesting. I think it's going to give a lot of people some food for thought, particularly uh, at, at the moment. Um, just before we, we go, I was very interested, um, maybe in the sort of the future of even of the system that you've got at the moment, because you talked a little bit about some heat recovery yes. options and things like that. Would you be able to just tell us a few more of your potential thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, right from the get go, you know, I'll be honest, our, our, our biggest driver to get this system designed and, and, and installed was receiving a near £9,000 water bill. Um, as we got into it, as we started to, to, to put it together, the fact that we are saving 2 million litres of good, decent drinking water a year, that's a real benefit. <clears throat> and it was it was that that started me looking at, well, hang on a minute. You know, we've got this hot water that we're just desperately trying to cool down so we can use the water again. Surely there's something we can do with that energy that we've effectively trapped. So we've got a very rudimentary system. You'd love it, David. It's so glamorous. It's a, <laughs> it, it's actually a, a repurposed uh, refrigeration unit off a kebab shop. Well, there you go. It was their walk-in fridge. Uh, I had a friend of mine take the um, refrigerant out. So now it's basically a radiator with three stonking great fans on it. <laughs> so when um, when we're trying to cool the stills down to, to make them safe to, to empty, to discharge, um, we've got a little radiator in the still and we run the smaller pump through the fan system and very crudely, but we're actually recovering some of that energy back into the building. Uh, so we don't have to wear three jumpers. So we're getting a little bit of heat recovery there. But it's it's made me realise that if we've got the stills running on a, on a regular basis, and I think all of these developments we're looking at will be predicated on a regular um, distillation run. Uh, and I think everybody at, at our level will, will know that you often tend to panic make what you need because there's an order come in. And, and then you wait for the next order. But... As we get more into it and we're doing regular forward planned, right, we're going to do two runs a week now for the whole year, and that's our production schedule, we can start looking at that waste energy um, and start doing some interesting things with it. So a couple of bits we've been looking at, um, can that wastewater be channeled through uh, a heat recovery system that warms the next charge that we're about to put in the still? So that'll reduce our heat up energy for the second run and that's something that we'll we'll be able to cycle through so if you're doing you know you're doing a run today you're going to do a cool down tomorrow refill and on day three do your next run as we're spending the day trying to get the temperature of the discharge water down to safe um, release levels well all the energy in that 2000 liters in the still can be transferred to the uh, waiting charge and effectively, if we can bring that in, even if we only get it to 30 or 40 degrees, that'll save us probably two hours of power 
in the, the next day heat up. So it's saving man hours, it's saving mm. energy. It, it, it starts to dovetail quite nicely. It's almost like you, you, I mean, I wonder if you can use the condenser, like almost not, not your actual condenser, but the principle of the condenser, but the other way around, you know, so that rather than being in touch with the, the liquid that you're producing, being cold to condense it you're yep. kind of having a hot basically a hot pipe running through it absolutely they kind of radiate off that that heat yeah and i think you know it's something we, we need to trial but but in principle it'll help the distillation efficiency as well yeah because we're removing energy heat from that closed loop water before it goes back into the tank to be recycled back into the still on that continuous system yeah. so we're kind of moving the energy out to um, a, a usable place um, and then obviously bring that um, charge back into the still. The other one we're looking at um, is we're starting to lay some spirits down in barrels. We've been doing that for two or three years. Um, one of the things I'm looking at there, I'm an absolute nerd, uh, but we've been tracking temperature and humidity in the barrels. So when the spirit's ready to uh, uh, to bottle, we've got a bit of an idea of what, what's been the temperature profile of those barrels um, to, to end up with that uh, product, that flavour, hopefully that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that we've got in the barrel. So part of me is looking at it and saying, well, if we had a, uh, let's say for rum, for example, we wanted to try and have, you know, a slightly um, faster, warmer, uh, maturation um could we not use some of the energy from the wastewater in the stills to provide heating within uh the barrel um the, the barrel storage area mm. so again if you know if we're running the still a couple of times a week well can we use that stillage water to to give us a an ambient 35 degrees in in our in our barrel storage area uh, and will that perhaps mimic um, maturation somewhere slightly more tropical than the mm. North Pole. Wow. Yeah. I mean, for the UK, you can't get much more tropical, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today, it really ain't tropical. Oh, especially today. <laughs> oh, look at it. Look at it. Glory. Yeah. I think we're into second winter this week. Yes. Yes. I think so. So, yeah. well, marvellous. I mean, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add, but I mean, I just think that it's all been fantastic. And I think, as I said, there's a lot to, to think about there and um, we'll um but um yeah unless there's anything else i'd just like to say thank you very much and um absolute pleasure as always mate excellent all the best see you all soon cheers bye cheers bye